All right. Hi there, everybody. My name is Rafael. Thank you all for joining this uh, first fully remote uh, go tonight. I hope everyone is doing well and uh, has enough toilet paper. Um, we have two talks. Uh, each of them has a Q and A at the end of the talk. Questions uh, related to the talk can be asked uh, in the Q and A. There is a button on the bottom. Uh, it says Q and A where you can ask your questions related to the talk. Um, the chat is to introduce yourselves network um, and ask questions during the break. We have a break in between the two talks. Um, also, please use, as Natalie mentioned, uh, use a drop down in the chat uh, and choose to speak to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see what you're saying and uh, what food you've eaten. Um, so a little bit about the GoTo uh, conference. GoTo Amsterdam is a multi-topic software development uh, conference that takes place uh, June 8th to June 11th. Uh, we have one all day of um, master classes and three days of conference. Um, for more information, you can visit the gotoamps.nl website or check out our YouTube channel, GoTo Conferences, for more information and uh, lots of video that are being uh, dropped over there. This session uh, is actually also recorded. So if you wanna um, watch it on YouTube, um, it, it is also gonna be published uh, through Twitter, I guess. Um, a link is going to be placed on the meetup page. Um, so no worries, um, everything is be, uh, being published. Um, before, um, let's see, yeah. Yeah, so this is our first time uh, doing it fully the remote way, as, I'm, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning. Uh, if you have any feedback on how and what we could do better, um, please don't hesitate. Um, it would really help us out um, to give us feedback. We will send a, um, an invitation link to a, uh, um, a form, a follow-up email afterwards, where we would uh, like to have uh, your feedback, just a few questions. And it would be great if you could answer them. And uh, if you fill out these, this evaluation form until Monday, uh, you have a chance to win the go to, uh, a GoTo Amsterdam uh, pass. So make sure you, uh, you uh, answer these questions and uh, help us out with it. Uh, a nice bridge to Pauline's talk. Uh, if you want to gain an uh, in-depth knowledge, practical knowledge of uh, Kotlin, um, and put it to immediate use in uh, real projects. Um, join Kotlin for Developers Masterclass uh, by uh, Venkat Subramaniam. First time. <laughs> uh, it's, the, it's the May 6th to uh, May 8th. So if you want to join a hands on uh, virtual masterclass, um, go to gotoacademy.nl. Everything is on the screen and don't miss it out. Without much uh, further ado, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Pauline from Van Alst. Pauline is a passionate uh, software engineer uh, in love with readable, reliable, and testable code, uh, independent of the knowledge or technology used. At Open Value, she works on uh, helping companies setting up better uh, software. And in her free time, she likes sports, cycling, and uh, swimming in particular. Uh, Pauline will, will enlighten us um, on what steps to take and where to start uh, migrating uh, to Kotlin with all its benefits uh, instead of Java 11 with the same effort. So now we'll give uh, the word to Pauline. Yes, thank you. Um, let me just share my slides with you. It's the first time that I'm doing a remote talk, so I hope it will uh, go all fine. Um, uh, yes. Let's put this in uh, presentation mode. As uh, Raphael said, I'm uh, just going to talk uh, to you about uh, how to migrate from Java to uh, Kotlin. Um, I did it a few times and I actually really love it. And um, I think uh, Kotlin is a very good alternative to Java if uh, you're thinking about upgrading from Java 8 or another version to the newest version that's uh, available nowadays. Um, so, in my first uh, bit of presentation of myself, I'm uh, working at OpenValue, as Raphael just said, and um, 
I'm also recording the barcoding podcast, which is a podcast about software engineering together with my colleague uh, Arnoud. You can find us on uh, iTunes, Spotify, and uh, Google Podcasts, and even more. Uh, you, I also, uh, oh, that went fast, those animations, but um, I also uh, like to uh, play board games during my free time. So that will be the topping of the application uh, that, that we're going to migrate tonight. You can follow me on Twitter under this uh, uh, yeah, Twitter account, but you can also follow my podcast at uh, coding underscore bar, which is a bit confusing, but it will work out. Um, so uh, first, a few highlights about uh, Java 9, 10, 11, and even more, because 14 just came out this week. Uh, just as a reminder of uh, what Java can propose to you uh, tonight, uh, today. So uh, Java is proposing switch statements, of course, since, uh, ja uh, since uh, Java 9, I think. It has type inference since uh, Java 11, which uh, enables you to have less boilerplate code. Uh, of course, it should be um, used uh, with some care and some rules. Um, and then there's a G shell that you can finally use if you want to uh, yeah, try something out about uh, Java. Uh, conveni convenience methods for collections has been added. Finally, we can uh, yeah, manipulate met, uh, collections a bit more easily. Um, that's, uh, that's a great feature as well, especially because we are um, using a lot of collections in our data models nowadays. So. Uh, Great improvement there. And uh, the release cadence has been changed. Uh, as you might know that every six months there's a new release with Java, uh, which means that you can uh, yeah, upgrade very fast with new features that are uh, a hype in the whole programming world, of course. And as of uh, Java 14 that came out this week, there are some records which are uh, yeah, equivalent to data classes, although they're still, a, I think, an experimental feature. So those are some really nice new features in the Java language. Um, and then I will first start with my story of Kotlin. I was uh, working back in the time on a new Java service where uh, we were really happy to have Java 8 and all its functional programming features. So we went a bit crazy, uh, especially with the streaming API. So um, we had a lot of pieces of code that were looking like this where uh, a lot of collections were manipulated using uh, filters and MapReduce statements. And actually, this is a small example. We had a lot of examples where the list was much longer with a lot of chaining of ma uh, list manipulations. So uh, yeah, in the beginning, it was really cool. And uh, at the end, we uh, kind of lost the track of uh, everything that we were doing on one collection. Um, so we're actually looking for something a bit uh, to transform those pieces of code into this kinds of pieces of code where a collection could just um, have some manipulations on it but in a readable human readable way and that we can talk to our product owner or business analysts about what we were doing so it's in this example we would like to uh, talk about having retrieving board games of a certain category that have more than two players and then um, retrieve on top of that all the board games uh, where should be more than 10 to play them and then finally calculate their mean price which is a much more fluent way of describing the steps that you're taking into your uh, uh, algorithm. Well we found that in Kotlin actually when we were looking to new solutions and it was a way for us um, during a hack day uh, we dived into Kotlin to see if we could use uh, a language feature that would uh, look like this and uh, we discovered lots of more language features which uh, made us very enthusiastic about Kotlin and as a team we we decided to migrate this Java 8 service back in the days to Kotlin. So I will tell you a bit more about how we did that uh, during this talk. So um, some uh, reasons to switch to Kotlin actually there are some pros and cons of course but one of them is the regular updates the updates are really really regular and it's actually quite easy to to update from uh, previous versions to the newest one that came out 
the interoperability with Java, with the Java ecosystem is also pretty good. There are some awkward tricks in there, but it's pretty good. And uh, a lot of frameworks in the Java ecosystems uh, are uh, taking Kotlin into account. So um, that's a big uh, plus. This will enable you to also migrate step by step, as I will show you uh, during the talk as well. It has the promise of being a multi-platform language, uh, which means that if you're uh, into the uh, application developments, uh, then you can actually use one code base for your iOS app or for your Android app or your uh, web uh, uh, website, actually. So that's a really great promise and uh, a very good reason, actually, to, to, to switch to Kotlin if you're into the mobile development. However, it's really good for um, backend services as well, as it also aims to improve the readability of your code. So a lot of language features in Kotlin uh, were designed to uh, improve uh, the readability of your code base. So if you accept the idioms of Kotlin, you will um, be facilitated in uh, making more readable code. Less boilerplate, if you're talking readability, you want to also read less, of course. So uh, less boilerplate will also help you out to have a more maintainable code base. And um, of course, safe programming. Um, if you might know Kotlin, you might know that um, uh, nil safety is a big uh, advantage in Kotlin. What to keep in mind, it's, it's not a, a silver bullet at all. Uh, there are also some stuff to keep in mind when you're migrating to Kotlin or when you're trying to take that decision to migrate to a higher Java version or to Kotlin or even use it as a, a language on a greenfield project. Of course, the interoperability with Java, as I just stated, um, it has some awkwardness. Sometimes you need to do some awkward tricks, uh, which are not fully Kotlin, uh, how do you say, uh, compliant. So it feels a bit awkward sometimes to talk against uh, a Java API or stuff like that. Uh, the idioms of Kotlin, if you don't understand the idioms of Kotlin and you're uh, migrating from Java to Kotlin, um, you won't get most out of uh, Kotlin. So um, it's really important to uh, understand the new Kotlin idioms before you switch from Java to Kotlin to really get the greatest advantage uh, of Kotlin. And as I just said, it's just not the magic problem solver. If you have a a maintainable code base, it won't solve your problems. So you first need to clean your code base up before you use Kotlin for sure. So first a warning, we're going to migrate a Java service and it might look a bit simple, but uh, please, when you do this at work, first do this at home at a, pro a pet project, because although it looks simple, it has its, its awkwardness and challenges. So it's, it's not that simple, of course, still a challenge. And, uh, so either you do it at home at your, and a, a pet project or at a proof of concept at work, but first try it out before uh, going all enthusiastic to your product owner uh, and do this in the scope of your story, for instance. So uh, let's start. Um, we are going to migrate a Java uh, service, which has two endpoints, one with um, retrieving all the rates above uh, above eight, for instance, uh, all the games were rated uh, above eight. And uh, sorry, the first uh, endpoint would be um, assigning rates uh, to a certain uh, game. So for, in for instance, an eight to the board game Dominion. And then the second endpoint would be to retrieve all the games that were rated higher than uh, an eight. So it would be Dominion, for instance, which is very popular, but also Ticket to Write is uh, often uh, highly rated, so you will retrieve that as well in such an endpoint. So let's uh, start a talk also about the technical part. It's a Spring Boot 2 application using an in-memory database, just out of convenience for the talk. It will actually um, show you the same challenges that you will have when uh, integrating um, uh, using a normal database. And uh, it was tested using uh, unit tests and integration tests. And I will also show you how to migrate those um, to, uh, to Kotlin. 
So my migration plan, um, as I would recommend it, would be to uh, migrate as follow. First, uh, it would be good to just set up the dependencies of Kotlin. It's uh, good to find that out at first and integrate them into your Java application. Uh, make sure it all works, that nothing crashes. Uh, with, uh, and not start directly to integrate your Kotlin code into your Java application. Uh, that's really important uh, because yeah, still adding new dependencies to your application. So uh, start with that. If you're uh, working with CI CD, it's a good point to just uh, make a release there if you want to. You just integrate with Kotlin, so why not? Uh, then it would be good to migrate on your only your plain Java objects for the very simple reason uh, that it's a very small step to take and it will offer you already a lot of benefits of Kotlin. So uh, that's a great second step. And you can even stop at that. If you decide as a team to have only your, um, your domain objects in Kotlin, because you, you want that, that's a fine uh, second step to have. Then um, the third step would be to rewrite your uh, unit test. Uh, because it's even though tests are equally important, important as your uh, production code um, it's sometimes a bit e it's easier code like there's no business logic whatsoever so it's easier to migrate so you can continue that your learning curve in Kotlin and then the fourth step would be a bit this is the biggest step this is the the biggest in uh, yeah the most important step is to migrate your core logic to uh, Kotlin uh, this is important one. You should ensure yourself that the unit tests that you just rewrote are still uh, validating your code uh, correctly. Otherwise, uh, you might not notice when you're making mistakes. And uh, of course, last but not least, the configuration of your application. That would be the last step. So uh, let's start. So for that, I will um, stop sharing my screen at um, in the presentation mode, if I can do that, yeah. Uh, and I will go back to IntelliJ. Uh, let's see if that's working out. Let's go to IntelliJ. So I hope this will work out and I hope you will see it as well. Um, the, uh, this is the project that we're going to migrate and it's the project structure that you will uh, see around here. Uh, it has a very simple API package over here, which uh, contains all the Java objects to describe a board game. So uh, in this case, a board game has a name, a category, a rating, of course, as we are rating board games in this um, in this application, an age range, a number of players, and um, then it has a service package which is holding uh, some uh, database integration uh, code, uh, some entities over here, and uh, also a service co uh, containing all the logic for uh, the endpoints. It has uh, two methods, one which is rating a board game and the other one is uh, retrieving all the board games which were rated higher than a certain rate. And last but not least, the rating uh, endpoints. So the first one to where the rating can be done by the user and the second one, which is over here, which uh, enables you to retrieve uh, the board games. Uh, all this is tested into unit tests, which you can see over here. Just pretty normal Java unit tests using Mokito for the unit uh, tests exactly and uh, JUnit 5. And the integration tests are, uh, yeah, just a uh, spring uh, integration test. So normally uh, this would uh, uh, run pretty well. Uh, I will just do a Maven uh, verify if that's working. 
Of course, the demo gods are with me, I hope so. <coughs> the Maven Verify will just run all the tests and prove to you actually now that my application is, uh, is working correctly. As I just said, I had uh, two unit tests and two integration tests. So, uh, yeah, as you can see, four tests were run. So in a normal Java application, tests are running and uh, yeah, and I'm assured that the logic uh, was uh, fine. So let's start migrating this. The first step of um, my uh, migration plan would be to set up the dependencies to integrate Kotlin into my application. I prepared a branch for that because it's a bit, um, it's not very interesting to do that in live coding, actually. Uh, so here it is, this is my POM. And here I have my two dependencies that are very needed for the Kotlin uh, compilation. I only add a dependency which is uh, integrating Kotlin compiling back to the JDK 8 with the Kotlin version in it and a Kotlin dependency for the unit test. Then I will scroll down to the plugins that uh, are needed to compile the code, of course. Um, here you can see it, it's a JetBrains plugin. It's uh, targeting the 1.1 JVM in this case. And um, in my executions part, I will be uh, configuring my source uh, directories. In a lot of um, examples that you will find on the internet, the applications will have two directories, one for Kotlin and one for Java. I'm fine with having the codes uh, living side by side. Um, so I will just use one directory, the Java directory. And when I'm done migrating it, I can just rename it to Kotlin, which is the final step to take. But I like to have the code side by side. It, it helps me out to, uh, to, yeah, to keep the oversight of, over my code base. So that's just a personal, personal matter. So, Let's see how the uh, application will behave. And I will again run my test using uh, Maven Verify. And that will just prove to me that uh, using my uh, new dependencies didn't harm the Java code into the system, right? So it's running right now, the, the Maven commando. You can still see that uh, we have some spring logging shown over here, which means that the application is still uh, starting up and that all four tests have run. So that one's good. That's the first step of our migration plan and it already was successful. So that's great. And then the second step of our migration plan would be to migrate uh, our Java objects um, into Kotlin objects. I will choose as a first step my API to migrate it. It's maybe exposing my uh, application to the world, but still, that's my first biggest gain to get, because here I have a lot of objects and I want to contain it a bit, so I will uh, start with the first thing to do, of course, is to start making a Kotlin file, which I will call board game, as that is the main object of my application. And I will go to my uh, Java equivalent class, which is called board game. And I, I'm a lazy developer, right? So I will just copy this code and just paste it over here. Uh, and there my IDE, IntelliJ, will uh, ask me if he wants to do the work for me. So, well, that's great. If I'm lazy, that's really good. Do the work for me. And then it will uh, transform the Java code into Kotlin code. However, it's a Java equivalent Kotlin code. So it's sometimes compiling when the uh, IntelliJ is doing that, sometimes not, but it's almost never really idiomatic Kotlin code. So let's start rewriting this piece of code a bit. First of all, I migrated from Java to Kotlin to have some uh, great uh, language features such as data classes. And for that, I don't want to use Lombok anymore. Uh, Lombok is also uh, using, uh, uh, yeah, giving you the opportunity to write data classes in a very concise way, uh, but I don't want to use third party dependencies. So that's why I'm getting rid of it. The add value 
uh, annotation in Lombok is kind of the equivalent as a data class in uh, Kotlin. Now it's a complaining a bit because it doesn't have a constructor yet. As I, after declaring my data class, I'm starting right away with curly brackets. To declare the constructor, I can just start with curly brackets, which I will just put in there like this. And as I'm using Kotlin for a reason, I don't want to have, uh, no, I want to have null safety. So I don't want to have nullable types. Nullable types in uh, Kotlin are indicated with a question mark. So we'll remove the question mark and I will definitely remove the uh, instantiation to the nil value. I just replace it with a comma because I'm still declaring a constructor over here. I will do that for all the fields. I forgot the comma over there and uh, just over here. So here I described exactly the same uh, object in the Kotlin as uh, was described in Java, just in one line of code without any third party uh, integration. So that's cool. I will just remove uh, the Java class. And now I hope it's still working out as I did a switch of classes. It was uh, definitely being used into uh, the endpoint. And uh, as I can see here, uh, IntelliJ is not complaining about it. It's even referencing to my Kotlin uh, class. So I'm only using one class, one Kotlin class here into an entire Java application. So let's see if um, that's still working out. If I'm doing a Maven verify. So if you're not using a Lombok, this will give you already a big advantage because then you can just um, remove all the get and setters because actually this data class is proposing you the following features. It's giving you getters to all the value fields which are indicated with the keyword val. Um, it will give you an immutable, immutable object with a full arc uh, constructor. And it will uh, also, this object will also have a two string method, a hash code method, a copy method as it's immutable and an equals. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty uh, great. The build was successful. So that means that my tests were still running and that my endpoints are still uh, validating, although they're using one Kotlin class instead of a Java class. So that went really smooth. So I can now do this with all the objects into my API package, but it's a bit annoying to do this uh, during the whole talk. We'll get you bored because it's a lot of copy paste work. So I prepared a branch for that, uh, which is uh, over here. And now what I did is that I used another language feature in Kotlin where I um, described this whole board game object, which is using here another, all other Java objects into uh, one file. So uh, as you can see here, you have the board game object, which I just migrated. I'm using an enum, which can be declared in such a way in Kotlin, which is an enum class instead of uh, just an enum, uh, the enum. Then the age range, um, I declared like this, but a lot of board games has a maximum age of 99 years old. So I just instantiated that using a default value, which is also a great advantage in Kotlin, um, using default values, which practically means that here you have two constructors, uh, one with one parameter, the minimum age, and one with both of them, if you want to override the default value. So this is about it. The whole, uh, oh, and of course, one object left the rating request, which is an object uh, that can be used to rate a game, uh, which is only declared here in one line of code. So that's, that's really compact code, right? Which is holding all the information that you want. So here again, I can, uh, I can still uh, run my test if I want to validate and be sure that uh, I broke nothing. And um, actually in this step, you can see that I migrated the whole API without uh, actually a lot of work. I gained a lot of uh, advantages instead of using a lot of files to describe my domain object, I only use one. It's also great to, to show to everyone else using the code base that those objects are really tightly coupled together. 
Uh, yeah, and it's still working. Um, so that's a very good second step to take. Then uh, let's go to the uh, third step would be to migrate my unit test. So I prepared that on a branch as well so that I can show it to you. I'm using two, uh, yeah, using two unit tests in this uh, example. And I already rewrote them in uh, uh, Kotlin. So as you can see here, um, I'm still using the Mokito extension, uh, the Java Mokito extensions. There is also a Kotlin a Mokito mocking framework, which is called Mock with two Ks, which can also um, help you out there to create perfectly fine mo mock objects. But I didn't need it here, so I'm just using uh, Mokito just to stay close to the Java ecosystem. Um, so that's about the mocking part. It's still using Java classes, but those are still Java classes uh, at the moment, so I'm fine with that. Um, the first great, uh, yeah, the first, actually first thing here to observe is that the uh, function uh, is prefixed with the fun keyword. So that's like some people will say functions are fun or programming is fun in Kotlin. And, um, and then a great advantage that you will have in Kotlin here is to uh, see the test. You can write uh, method names uh, between those uh, brackets. Um, yeah, no quotes, um, I would rather say. And in, the, in those quotes, you can have a proper sentence. So no snake case or camel case discussion into your team. You can just write human readable uh, sentences if you want. I would advise to only use this feature into uh, test code and no uh, production code. Uh, in testing code, it's really great to have this feature to describe the scenario that you're testing. Then I'm uh, using uh, Mokito, so I want to mock the, uh, how do you say it? I want to mock the behavior of my uh, objects. And for that, uh, I'm using when, but when is uh, the when uh, method. Uh, but that's already claimed the keyword in Kotlin, so I have to escape them again with those quotes. Then what you can see is that when this repository is retrieving something using this name, I want to return a popular game. And this is the first great feature in Kotlin, which is called uh, uh, the, uh, the extension functions. Uh, sorry, I lost the, the name in. Uh, extension functions will allow you to declare functions on an object, already existing object. And that should be used for, with care for sure, but uh, it can be very useful for uh, this example where you want to have really human readable uh, tests. It can be also very, very useful for collection manipulation. That's the, remember the example that I gave at the beginning of the talk with those human readable steps of collection manipulation that can be done with this language feature. So I did that over here. Let's look how this extension function looks. It's just looking like this, where you have this really weird and complicated object uh, that is uh, when you're mocking something, then the name of the method and uh, the operation. And the then return, you will probably recognize it from the Java world. So let's go back to the test. I'm still using some other nice uh, language feature of Kotlin. I'm uh, using uh, destruction of, a ver of an object where you can uh, actually this, um, method is uh, returning the object uh, board game but in this case i'm only interested in the rating parameter so i'm declare all the other ones are being in ignored by the underscore and only this value will uh, have a name rating and then i can do some assertions on it so this is how i uh, wrote the test i just converted them so let's run them they're running against java code so uh, I'm curious to see if uh, they're still running. So let's see. It's uh, doing a lot of stuff. You can see it over here. But I hope it will work out. It's taking a bit of time because it has to, uh, to process some stuff. And there it goes. Now it's starting. I don't know. Hmm. 
might not be working now in IntelliJ. So what I would do, never change good habits, right? I will uh, just uh, do the Maven verify the Maven job again, which is running all my tests again. Meanwhile, you also see that I um, constructed a new list over here in my second test, just using the list of method, where I can just in one line declare a new list with all its elements in it in there. Important to know that uh, this is an immutable list, so you can't add any other elements after it. Um, so that's the main uh, thing over here. Now, the two tests are run, the four tests actually already run. So I just rewrote my unit test and everything is still functioning. I'm pretty confident that the assertion summer tests are also working well. <coughs> so uh, that's that's great. So my uh, this was my second step was to um, refactor all my unit tests and um, no it was my third step sorry so now I'm going to my fourth step would be to um, refactor all my uh, business logic I prepared something for that as well a new branch as uh, you may recall I uh, am using a database into this application an in-memory database uh, however it's using GPA to do all the queries on the database. So um, there's something interesting going on here because that means uh, that I need to talk uh, to my database using, uh, using uh, Spring Data. And uh, in order to populate my Java entities with yeah, all the data that are lying in the database, Spring is using reflection. So that means that the objects should be mutable and instantiated, first being instantiated and then without any values and then being populated with all the values coming from the database. Um, that means that uh, it's breaking Kotlin there because Kotlin, you will probably declare data classes for your entities, but those won't have, will only have a full argument constructor and won't have any setters as we embrace immutability and so on. So for that, I need to add a configuration uh, parameter into my Maven plugin for Kotlin, which is uh, the G GPA plugin. And I want to have a no R constructor on all those objects. Uh, we need a no R constructor and then being populated with the data. So those are the first two dependencies and uh, there should be also a logging dependency. Ah, it's in the other branch, which I probably will show you later on. Uh, first a bit of scrolling. Yeah, there is a, also a logging dependency, which I will show you over here. The Kotlin uh, logging dependency. I'm using that because I will be also using some uh, string uh, features. And for that, I need some string optimization. I will talk to you about that later on. So let's migrate my business um, logic. I In this branch, I already migrated the entities. Those are just data classes, as I just said, with all the annotations needed uh, for them to be uh, database entities. Let's go to my logic class. This is the most important part of my application. So this is also the most critical step, I would say. Uh, in my migration plan. So let's start again with creating a new file called board game rating surface. Same name as a Java file, of course. I will uh, get every annotation except the SL4J annotation because I'm using my own. Uh, the Kotlin framework. I will just space it over here. And this is great because IntelliJ is again telling me uh, that it will do my work uh, for me. So that's great. Uh, let's just convert it uh, to uh, from Java to Kotlin. It's uh, thinking now. It's doing a lot of uh, thinking to make it work. And now you will see that uh, probably, yes, it's not compiling uh, because their IntelliJ uh, lost its way. So this is fine. Uh, 
first of all, let's start, uh, let's go, yeah, uh, line by line through this code. So it's a spring uh, class. Spring beans need to be extended by the spring framework. So you may, uh, as classes are final in Kotlin, you may use the open keyword to make them extendable by the spring uh, framework so it can do its job. I'm just using the constructor over here uh, with the dependencies, the pending beans. I will uh, just list them like this. I like this for readability. I will uh, remove this uh, annotation. I don't use it right now. I don't know why it's, uh, it's using the internal keyword, but I want this function to be exposed as my endpoint is using it. So uh, here it is. Then you will see here that uh, my uh, method that is rating my board game is first declaring an object, the rate entity that will be persisted later on in um, the database. Instead of using methods like get board game name, I can just access my um, values directly, like I'm doing over here. A great feature for uh, of Kotlin as well, I think. It's uh, all those uh, get blah 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 methods are gone. Now I'm, I lost my um, my logging because I need to declare that still, and here I will be using that special uh, logging framework. So it's not called logger. It's called Kotlin logging, I think. Ah, good. First start with the name and then I don't need to. I'm always a bit doubting about the Construction about this. Uh, let's see. I've kind of forgot. Let me just check out what it was. Uh, sometimes I would ask a crowd, but now it's a bit. Uh, Different as I can't read. Ah, there I have it. I forgot the syntax, but I'm back again. I have it over here. So this way I can use a fully Kotlin logger actually, where I can use this really great um, string features in, uh, in, in, in Kotlin, where instead of having this uh, replacements of strings, uh, I can use them like this. I uh, like, really like this string interpolation in uh, Kotlin because uh, it assures me that I'm not making mistakes, uh, especially for logging. It's important that you know that you're doing those replacements at the right, uh, yeah, in the right place. So uh, using string interpolation in that way is a very safe uh, thing for your logging. I will do the same for the logging statement that's over here. Using the dollar sign uh, to indicate that it's code that is going to be replaced over here. And then I'm uh, coming to my return statement over here, uh, where it's looking really complicated, but I using Kotlin to have simple code, right? So it's retrieving a board game by name, which is an optional object. And then uh, it's mapping towards uh, a DTO object. And here there is a whole bunch of code, which is complicated. I will just remove that uh, like this. And it shouldn't be red. Yeah, no, it's it's okay. I'm uh, mapping to the rated board game here. Oh, I okay. Uh, and I'm using the it keyword, uh, or in this uh, way, this just uh, uh, yeah the basic of when you're uh, using a predicate in uh, Kotlin, you can use the is keyword to uh, reference to the object that's manipulated. So um, else is throwing uh, this exception. I will continue on here with the another function here. The rate is nullable, but I don't want it to be nullable. So I'm removing the question mark. I will then 
use uh, the logging statement, I will here use the rate directly as it's not an expression, I can just uh, omit the curly brackets. And then I'm going to this collection manipulation over here when it's retrieving all the board games from the repository, and uh, which is a collection. And in Kotlin, I can finally remove the stream um, concatenation here, or conversion, uh, because Kotlin has the same, has a really pretty good interface on collections. So I can remove uh, all this difficult code that I don't want. I can just remove it over here. And I can still do some yeah, mapping uh, on my collections. However, something that's really important to keep in mind here, that collections uh, don't support lazy evaluation by default. So if I want to have lazy evaluation, I need to uh, use S sequence over here to have that evaluation again. So you lost a stream, you're gaining a sequence. I don't expect my application to using a lot of uh, board games, so we'll just remove it. I'm uh, comfortable with that. Then here, Intelligent made some destruction of the variable. I will just remove it because I actually only need it like this. I can exactly, I can access uh, my values using uh, it, the rating, that average rate, and that's fine. Finally, I don't need to collect everything back to a list because the output of it is still a collection, so I'm fine. So you can see that my uh, collection manipulation is uh, very small. So let's go back over here. Still my logging statements a bit much of them, but I'm okay. Now here I'm calculating the average of all the average rating of the board games that I'm retrieving. So I will, uh, that's again is a collection that I won't be putting to uh, a stream. I will then directly map them to the average, or at least to their uh, rate, so I can calculate the average. As I said, I don't need to use a getter, so I can just directly access my value over here using uh, it.rate. And I need, don't need to cost it back to a double, so it should be compiling, but it's not. Oh yes, it is, it's just a bit slow. So that's about it. So I just, um, the, and the whole, uh, how do you say it? Yeah, conversion of the board game rating surface. I can now just remove my uh, Java class. And let's see uh, how it's working out right now. Oh, that alias is not found. I will just use a clean because uh, I did some manipulations into the compilation plugin. Just check it out if it's working. So it's uh, running again. So that's fine. And apparently my endpoint uh, test succeeded. As you can see here, my four uh, tests run perfectly. So let's see how it will look if I uh, cause, if I convert all the code to uh, Kotlin. I will just test this piece of code for a while and then go uh, to my uh, final branch, which is over here. And this branch I migrated, I think everything collapsed. Oh to, um, yeah, everything was still uh, converted. So that's great. I also migrated my endpoint from Java to Kotlin, where here I'm uh, using uh, the same uh, open keyword to open up my, uh, to make it not final, I mean, so Spring can be used it. I'm, uh, the rest would, just look like um, look like uh, the Kotlin code. There's no big differences here also with the Java code as well. It's pretty neat actually. So uh, that's fine. So now let's go back. Let's go to the last but not least step, which is to migrate my configuration, which is the 
uh, spring uh, configuration, so we'll check that out. It's also in a, uh, in a file. Here I uh, migrated my uh, repositories, which are interfaces over here, which are extending the standard spring data interfaces using uh, the semicolon instead of using the extends uh, uh, or implement uh, keyword actually. The override keyword, so you don't need to override annotation. It, it became a keyword in Kotlin. And uh, this would be my uh, Spring Boot class, which is an open class without any class definition whatsoever and out of the scope, but in the same file, the main method, which will uh, boot up your application actually. So last time I will be validating this against my test. And this will actually be my last step because as you can see, my whole production code just um, was migrated to Kotlin. So let's see. Uh, let's see how this is working out. So uh, in the meanwhile, it looks like it's uh, still compiling. It is test the application is still booting, right? So that's the, that was the last part of this step. It's still going well. Uh, there's some spring logging over here. It's maybe going a bit fast if it's remote, but uh, you can trust me. The four tests uh, run perfectly. So that's great. I will now stop sharing my uh, IntelliJ session and go to my presentation just to wrap it up. Uh, oh, I forgot to share that with you. Uh, let's share my screen and let's share my application, uh, my presentation. So now you can see the slides where I was left. So coding we already did. So what we did, we set up all the dependency needed to use Kotlin. We migrated the plain Java objects. We rewrote the unit test. Uh, we rewrote the core logic of our application, pretty critical step, and uh, we rewrote the configuration. So thank you all. You all migrated uh, a Java application to Kotlin in uh, a few minutes. So welcome on board. And um, yeah, normally this would be the time to do some uh, questions. Uh, first, before closing, I would say that I will publish into the chat room the GitHub repo with all the coding. Uh, so you can just fall back and read it through. If there are any more questions, you can also ask them uh, later on uh, after this session on Twitter as well, if they pop up into your mind. So uh, Raphael, I guess we are now doing the questions. Yeah, let's see. Um, am I back in game? Yeah, I, at least I can hear you. Thank you very much, Pauline. <laughs> it's really weird to do this remotely. <laughs> you have no feedback whatsoever. So, <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So one question is already answered. The code will be available. Um, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. That was one question. Um, I also had a question. Uh, what What were the one of the most uh, uh, issues you would get to with migrating? I heard some stories about constants and field injections. Are there any uh, issue mm. you you and your team were most heard of? Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, I get that question a lot. Uh, what you will sometimes hear is about the compiling time. Uh, Kotlin will take a bit more time to compile as it's doing a lot of uh, stuff. Um, mm. So that's one issue. The other issue is of course the integration with Spring can still be a bit uh, awkward sometimes. Um, and the other issue is when you're integrating a lot with Java APIs. Uh, Java APIs has a, have a lot of nullable objects, which means that you're breaking all your coupling uh, idioms there. So what I would advise there is to make some wrappers around those Java objects so you can get a bit more comfortable uh, coding against those objects. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, otherwise I didn't really experienced very much of uh, problems over there. No, I was always smooth. I really like it. <laughs> yeah. um, nice, great. 
So there was one other question of uh, Christian. Uh, is there anything special to do for the dependency injection in the service? Uh, he says, I see IntelliJ marks the dependencies as resolvable. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, all your uh, Spring Beans should be open classes. If they're final, Spring can't do anything with it. Uh, so that's a good thing. I learned actually more about Spring than about Kotlin while migrating from Java to Kotlin, actually. So um, yeah, your Spring Beans should be declared as open. There is a Maven plugin for those things. Um, but field injection should be perfectly fine as I was experienced until now, so yeah. Right, great. Mm. So those were uh, the two questions. Um, let's see, we can have, all right, there's one other question coming in right now. Okay. Um, from an anonymous, oh, anonymous. Oh. I didn't get the point about migrating to Kotlin. What's the biggest? Oh. What's the biggest? Change. What's the biggest change? Well, I think the biggest change is that you will have less code for sure. Um, and that uh, maybe I could expose that a bit more, but you, you, you have your null safety over there, which is really, really nice. Actually, you, you're forced yeah. to, uh, to think about what it would be when it's not, uh, when it's, yeah, not failed actually. Uh, the other thing is, yeah, your collection manipulation, which I find, yeah, much more elegant over there, um, which is much more concise. You don't need to convert everything back to a collection, uh, even if it's just a normal collection or a sequence. Um, I like that. I like to, to, to work like that. Um, I also like the thing that it's, uh, everything is immutable by default. Uh, that makes you, it's maybe a bit hard to, to program like that, but uh, in my opinion, it's much safer. Yeah. So that's a big advantage as well. Yeah. Yeah, and it has also better support for functional programming, right? Yeah, it's a way better functional programming support than, than Java it has, for sure. Um, of course, Kotlin now uh, doesn't need, it's pretty new still, newish, so it doesn't have uh, big issues with backward compatibility, but it will have some awkward stuff like Java has now in a while. So, yeah, it should still be, uh, so it can become a bit, uh, how do you say it? Verbose like Java is now in in the future, but for now it's really great. I think. Yeah. And did, did you notice any um, um, general performance uh, benefits or memory consumptions in that way uh, running uh, Kotlin Java? Yeah. Uh, uh, really or? I didn't see any performance uh, enhancements or uh, yeah. Or the, uh, yeah, didn't see any performance changes uh, really, but I didn't really measure it either to make sure. There are some articles about it, but I guess you should just see, uh, yeah, application by application, what the impact is and what uh, what you're doing. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, we will have a 15 minute break. Um, uh, after that, we will get to our next uh, session, which is with uh, Yoast Heiko. Uh, he's going to do a live coding session. Um, people can answer your questions, right? Uh, in the break, in the that chat. they can ask me questions for sure. I will just uh, post the link of my GitHub repo uh, uh, right now in the chat. So we'll stop sharing my screen and uh, yeah, put the GitHub. Yeah. All right, great. So for everybody that is uh, still hanging up right there, um, you can ask questions to uh, Pauline in the, the chat. Um, the next ses session is going to start at 7.45, so in 15 minutes, we will start with the next session. Um, yeah, so we will get back to everybody in uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you all. So shoot some questions <laughs> or else, you know, grab a beer, do what you need to do, put your kids to bed, um, take your dog out for a pee. <laughs> oh, I think I... Uh...
I think I left uh, it for a while. So. Okay, so um, can you see the question? Can you explain why Kotlin isn't the next Groovy? Um, yeah, I can explain that. Um, Groovy didn't have much traction into the enterprise world, which meant that uh, uh, I think only Jenkins is a big tool that I can think of that, uh, uh, how do you say it, uh, was using Groovy. Uh, Kotlin really is, is being used in a lot of uh, companies. Uh, Spring and uh, I can name Netflix, I can name Google, of course, uh, I can uh, name a lot of them. Uh, but it's also uh, the, in the Java ecosystem, uh, some frameworks really uh, announce their support for Kotlin. So even Spring is saying, okay, we we believe in Kotlin and we are going to uh, support them. So that gives me a lot of confidence that actually um, it will be uh, not free or Scala whatsoever. Uh, I'll be posting also my GitHub link over here now. So here it is. Yeah. Other questions? Um, there's one question. Question. Yeah. Uh, our extension methods different than Scala implicit. Uh, and that's a rather technical uh, <laughs> questions. I think they're in a way. Uh, I'm not that into Scala actually I use it a bit um, so uh, I can't really uh, answer that actually on the technical level but I guess they're in how you use them in your coding would be kind of the same yeah yeah of course yeah, yeah. anyone else with questions okay then I'll mention it now so um, just for everyone to know, at the end of our go tonight, we will have to turn it off at some point. But if you want to keep talking and conversing, um, we did open a Slack channel. And I think it was, it was posted um, into our chat. So get up onto that Slack channel and you, know, you can continue chatting, talking to each other. Um, network and um yeah have a virtual beer with each other <laughs> so it's nice it's in the chat Papa. uh so can everyone see me of course they can't um, no, wait a minute. how do i put up the chat yes i have chat Okay, cool. So uh, this is going to be interesting. Uh, this is going to be a live coding session. Uh, I hope it works. Uh, it's I gonna, I, sorry, you can't see? No, I cannot, cannot see your screen. Am I in? <laughs> ah, this might help. <laughs> uh, yes, <Nice. laughs> security. Uh, so yeah, hey, hi everyone. Uh, uh, this is going to be the live coding session uh, with all the problems that it's going to entail. Uh, it's going to be uh, about creating a um, Webflux reactive web server. And uh, for the fun of it, we're going to do a uh, functional style, do a lot of reactive stuff. And uh, uh, I hope to build an application where you can all chat to me using the application. So I might get to deploying it to Heroku at some point, but I'm not sure if we're going to make it. We'll see how far we get. Uh, let's start with creating a project in IntelliJ. And we do that by creating a new project, a Gradle project with fancy Kotlin DSL script. IntelliJ, uh, do the rest for us. Do you, want, do you want to share your screen? Am I sharing my screen? No. You're not yet. Sharing. I am not sharing my screen. Oh, that, that. No. I thought I pressed the button. I'll try again. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yes. Um, so I, I created an IntelliJ project. Uh, what I did, I can show half of it. I uh, chose to build a Gradle project with Kotlin DSL. Uh, I don't care for Java right now, so I'll do 
Kotlin. I started this and then I got this. And I have an empty project with a Kotlin folder. And we're going to do a nice hello world here. All right, I can manage to work type on the machine right now. Right, so we did hello world. Hey, everyone can do a hello world now. Um, so let's start out with uh, a bit about me. So I'm Joost. Uh, I'm a passionate software craftsman, as I call it. You know, people call it engineer or developer, but I think I, I, it's a craft where, which entails quite a bit of art to get things right. Um, I have a non-Java background in the sense that I am a hardcore Scala developer. Uh, it's my uh, biggest skill. Uh, um, but yeah, I do a bit of everything. I am a jack of all trades. I do whatever it takes to build a product, uh, to get it to production, and to make the customer happy. And I've ended up doing a lot of JVM work, uh, a lot of front-end work with uh, JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, Angular, React, all the things. So I hope to sh uh, show you a bit of this. Um, what I also believe in is, is minimal magic. Um, I, I shied away from Java a long, long time ago because of boilerplate and uh, yeah, way of working of, of the, the ecosystem, uh, which also involves quite a bit of annotation magic. I've used a lot of uh, Project Lombok to get rid of quite a bit of the magic, but then yeah, we introduce, uh, the boilerplate that introduces a lot of magic. Um, yeah, recently I rediscovered sort of Java-like ecosystem uh, by being introduced to Kotlin. And once I saw Kotlin, uh, I thought this is the future for Java development. Uh, for, to me, it makes all, all makes a lot of sense. It's very uh, in line with what I, with what I already know, functional, immutable, uh, all the stuff which yeah, you, you sort of live with if you're, if you're a Scala developer are natural to me and are natural in, in Kotlin, but this might not be true for you. Um, so I hope to, to uh, keep you following along. Um, but yeah, it might be that you have questions. I hope you can ask them afterwards, because for me, it's very hard to follow the comments on Zoom uh, while I'm doing a live coding session. Uh, so I'll probably look at them afterwards. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I would like to say uh, the best way to start a project with uh, Spring is to use the, the Spring Starter, which is sp uh, start.spring.io, which I've heavily used and looked at. Uh, and also I did a lot of Stack Overflow programming. And this is gonna look like a Stack Overflow program session because I'm gonna be uh, copy pasting from my cheat sheet a lot. Uh, but I, I hope to show you and, and really give you the feeling that you're building the application uh, as we go, um, and uh, yeah, hopefully you learn something from it. So let's go. Um, I have a nice project here. I started this. That the first thing I do is initialize my Git. Uh, and then Git. Yes. Git remote add. So. Uh, because I, I intend to publish all of this and uh, I set up a Heroku uh, build so that you can see what's going on at the end. Um, let's uh, rebase against a nice uh, repo I set up and uh, let's go. Um, the first thing we are going to do is set up the build so that we have some spring in it. This is the standard build uh, IntelliJ generates for you. Uh, uh, it, well, it sort of works. It, uh, it has uh, Kotlin in there. It will also probably do Java, uh, even though I disabled it. Uh, but yeah, it, there, and there are no libraries in here, and Spring is an ecosystem that every, relies on uh, libraries. So let's fill in our Gradle file so that we can do some Spring programming. So I'm going to replace this with the actual. When I just copy paste it, 
Uh, what this does is adds the Spring uh, plugin uh, provided by JetBrains, actually, all the things that start with Kotlin are JetBrains projects. And uh, this makes Spring uh, integrate much better with Kotlin. Uh, we also have the Spring uh, framework itself, Spring Boot, and their dependency management uh, plugin, which makes you not type all the version numbers here, uh, and probably a lot more. And uh, we start out with uh, the Kotlin integration with the Java standard library. Uh, we need some reflection because that's how Spring operates. And we want to have uh, the, the web clocks. So this is really bare. It's just only web clocks. Uh, nothing else yet. And we're going to start from here. We go back to our project. Let's see if anyone has a comment now. Maybe it can't see your screen. That's all news. I guess. Or you can't still you still can't see my screen. No, it was beforehand. Okay, and it's only six minutes. Okay. Yeah. And I'm gonna start with a data class. I'll just be a happy coding in uh, with this one file for now. I might eventually build some architecture in there. Yeah, luckily, Kotlin doesn't constrain you in any way, so you can do whatever you want. So we create a, a model, we create a, a handler, which is also our repository right now. In our repository, uh, why is Flux not out the computer? For a bit, see if that helps. Yes, it's out the computer. Nice. So we're starting out with our handler, which is the thing we call from uh, the routing. Uh, the routing. Uh, for now, we just have an in-memory store, uh, if you want to call it, uh, of uh, three items, which are just some pictures, and uh, we have a uh, function to get them and uh, this is you know, one piece of copying magic I don't really like but we need it for our steel ports. I'm going to look if I have a few sheet. So to make this work, we need a certain uh, extension function in, in scope. Uh, oh wait, this is still there. Never mind. Let's see if IntelliJ manages to add some features first. Uh, we always choose reactive because yeah, that's what we're going for. In this thing, we need a magic import. Let's see, is it this one? No, of course it is. Different thing. Um, so the normal responses you generate uh, with the status code, they work. Uh, but to be able to work with flux, we need this, an adapter which allows us to take an a body with a different parameter, a flux, instead of the body inserter you're used to. Uh, yeah, and what the rest is, uh, what I like about Kotlin is uh, less magic than in Scala, and uh, less fiddling with the imports, but uh, there's still these extension functions can be hard to get right. So you might learn some by heart eventually. Um, so let's go on. Uh, we have our handler, uh, let's build some routes. So we're going to build a basic root, which is just a get, um, which is dependent on our user handler. Uh, to get this to work, we need more imports. Oh. What 
Media type, yes. Uh, so now we've set up the roots. We already have our handler and our roots, and the roots they uh, pass down to our handler. Uh, our roots have a uh, dependency they depend on. Uh, but instead of using uh, injects uh, annotations, we're going to only name them as a constructor argument, constructor uh, injection. And uh, what we're left with is setting up a tiny bit of spring magic that's leaks out of uh, out of spring even though we're doing using the functional api uh, just because we need to register our beans but luckily uh, the guys for spring they created this nice dsl for uh, making this much more explicit uh, instead of having annotations uh, scattered around your project and the last part is to have an application actually does something. So my hello world is going to be replaced by a main function that uh, initializes our context, uh, sets up the handling for well, the routes that we set up here. They need to somehow be uh, made apparent to the HTTP server. And provided here. So we now have a file of more, say, 40 lines of code. And uh, if we run this, instead of a hello world, we have a web server. Block terminated with error. Build blind. Try something new. Okay. Try again. So we have a test running. You can see it, it starts really fast. I don't know if this is special to uh, the functional way or this is normal to push Spring Boot 2 nowadays. It's, it's fast already. But yeah, it's much faster than starting up most other applications I'm used to. And if we now start up a REST client, we can actually see this does stuff. And ta da, we have a result. It nicely uh, echoes the three items we put in here. So, well, we're done. We have a reactive web server. But let's now uh, make it a bit more fun uh, and add a front end to it. So, what we're now going to do is uh, we'll create reactive. If I download the internet, yeah, uh, installing uh, Java libraries takes a while. We always have this running gag of it installing the whole internet, but yeah, in JavaScript, you nowadays install uh, at least tenfold of that. So this may take a while. And to make it pretty, like it's the uh, things I'm going to add, I'm going to also add material UI to it. Because yeah, it's just how I know to how to write the UIs nowadays. Uh, While well, we wait for this, I'm going to console what else I need to do. Before we do npm start after this. Let's see if anyone has any questions. No questions yet? Okay, nice. Yeah, the internet. Yes, and then uh, we start off the front end. We now have a very nice uh, default application here, which takes a while to load. Yes, and it's already broken. Mm -hmm. 
And now, if we go back to our browser, hey, we have a thing, and I can write text in it. And uh, to be able uh, to do this, uh, I created the text fields that's hooked up to uh, a bit of state that records what's in the text fields. And if you press Control Enter, uh, hmm, interesting. I should say, uh, then uh, it picks up the message and which is in the list of messages, which is displayed in our grid uh, thing. Uh, this is very interesting, but now we have no way of manipulating uh, our data. We can only like look at it, record this, and if we then uh, refresh the page, it's gone. So for one, uh, let's try to load some state from our backend. By looking at my other cheat sheet. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, uh, I can write this by hand right here. No. Yeah. We're going to load some data from the back end. And yep, it's happy. And now we need to actually load this. So we're going to do it in this way. Load the fence one. Do it and now if we refresh the page, it should actually call out to our web server, which it doesn't. That's for Carol, there's a the fetch resource. Ah, right, because now we have this issue that we're doing cross origin uh, stuff. So now we are going to configure our backend to. Um, I hope I'm not going to pass from here. Yeah, works perfectly. So now, next to the beans, we also need to uh, set up our course. Um, instead of configuring this through some settings, we can uh, make this explicitly add it explicitly to our web server by adding a filter to it like so and now if we uh, 
to start over with. Mm -hmm. And now, if we look at that page, and then we load, it should load data. And it's not there because we misnamed it. Of course. That's fine. Yes, automatic, that's fine. Ah, but not the versions. Name is so that I'll make sense again. And it starts. Like I can't seem to get the whole reloading working with this functional API. I don't know if this is a feature or not. No. And now we can add that for us. This is good. So you have to reproduce all the types unless you're just doing something like Swagger. Wait. How could the TypeScript has some hints, but Anonymous. Hmm, interesting man stuff. Still second uh, grade and slides. Yeah. 
nasty. Then we get Kaylee there. Uh, we have the message, we have the user, we have created that. Okay, it's all strings, strings with slices. Rid of this thing for now. See, just make it happy. Yes, that works. It's just really weird. Splices for now. Sure. So, hello. Well, we now learn a uh, load some database uh, stuff. And, ah, let's go. And, uh, here uh, we load some data for the depth for, for the back end. It's our fixture data. Uh, which yeah, still we need to somehow uh, we can add data in here. We can refresh that data is gone. We, we would like to save this, of course. Uh, to be able to save this, uh, we need to create an extra endpoint. And uh, I'm going to add this here. Uh, in my infinite voice wisdom, I added the user. I should just replace it like that. And then. Yeah. Should now start to write to the backend. So uh, let's open the console. And then it says 404. We don't have this thing in the backend. Uh, back so we need to now add uh, an extra endpoint, which is the post. Uh, we need to create our extra function, which is the add message. Ah, which in this case is way too hard. request body and yeah because input data is not the same as your model we're going to create an extra class for this uh, because we want the timestamp uh, the timestamp to be determined by the back end we're going to extract only that and here is the message Uh, 
like that. And then uh, so for now, just switch like this. Okay. Jason. It should be set up. Why can't you find it? Oh, because I don't have one with any mic. Require server. Press the model and cover key function. Ah, yes, we need types. Yeah, that should be right. Uh, Server sure response. Uh, of course, I always ask if there's anything else. That's time. This is what I'm looking for. Yes, now this is what this works, and this thing is broken. Why is it broken? No value. Ah. Let's go on this. We go. We go. But this is what we had. Why is it playing? Absolutely. And then we can restart the application. And now we should be have a front end that is able to post. Okay, the server error, of course. Terminated. Why does it terminate? Yes, the demo gods are not kind to me. Do I have two views on the same version? This is the right version. I should be looking at this. It should be running. Cannot construct instance add message. No constructors. Ah, yes. Uh, so now uh, we're trying to deserialize stuff, and for this we need a plugin in our build file. Uh, we need it. Yeah. 
this thing. So to be able to deserialize, uh, Spring uses Jackson, but Jackson has no, uh, no good way of dealing with the case classes from copying by default, so we need a special extension for that. And we need stuff to, I don't think that's necessary for this one. And now we should be able to deserialize it. Right again. And the post, the post is successful. Hey, nice. And if you now refresh the page, we have nothing, of course. Uh, because we have a dummy implementation right now. Uh, we go back. Our add message actually only echoes what we have instead of having a uh, thing we need. How much time do I have left? We were already running at the end. So, Natalia, how long can I overrun? And Natalie, sorry. Okay. Are you, uh, do you, do you need a little bit more time or? Well, I could use a bit more time, else I'm going to be copy pasting much way faster. Uh, How long do you need? I'll give you five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, that's going to be very fast copy pasting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I'll go go happy copy pasting then. Uh, so let's take a look at this thing. Where is it? Um, yeah, so this thing we don't care about right now. This thing we do care about right now. We actually want to convert our message to a message, and to do this, we uh, we're gonna build this extension function so that the um, separation of concerns instead of putting it in our data we want to go ahead put it here. Some very big issues with getting the timestamps to record correctly. Uh, oh, this JavaScript is real. Oh. Oh. We're now going to convert it, and this is what we now know. What we're now going to do is uh, create a lock, just say. Yeah, that's what you get when you're trying to program backwards. Like I have the end result, but I don't have the beginning. Uh, what we're going to do is update our messages and uh, do this by making it a bar and uh, getting, letting the thing we get in uh, into the list so that we now get to record it and then return back the, the actual data model. Uh, why can't I see the users because it's called messages? Like that. And now that all is happy, so I'm going to start. Yes. And now if we oh, no, no, sorry. refresh the page. 
So we add some data in there. If it gets sent to the backend, if we now load the page, then we get uh, data from the backend. Um, yeah, and now I wanted to show you web sockets, but that's going to take about at least 15 minutes more to get that going. Because we actually want to have live updates. And uh, let's see if I can simply close this window <laughs> and open the other window. Tremendously. And now if we uh, add the message, we'll see what, what happens here that we post like before. Uh, but when we start the application, we actually open up a web shopping. And what the app does is um, now when it gets a message, uh, it also sends the message back as soon as it has accepted it. And for this, uh, we turned uh, we created a WebSocket handler, and that WebSocket hand handler, uh, well, the, the other parts here, uh, where is it? Mess handler actually subscribes there or uh, sends messages to it when it does an add message. And uh, our shortcut handler actually makes people who uh, try to connect subscribe to it and they get a message back. Uh, but yeah, this is way too much detail to go into. And to get all this all working, uh, we need to create a special handle function uh, for our, our web uh, our HTTP handler, which switches on, on behavior. So uh, if we start with a socket in our, uh, well, if you have slash socket, then it starts the web server uh, socket handler, and else it just delegates to our roots. And uh, yeah, this pushes back all the notifications we want. So. Uh, let's go to quits for now and uh, continue this at the end. Uh, uh, I will uh, post this uh, and then you, uh, I think in 10 minutes I should have posted this to uh, Roku and I can, people can play with it and look at the uh, repo and see what's going on. Um, so let's end it at this. All right. Thank you very much, Joes. Thank you very much. If you want to, you can uh, paste the link of the, the GitHub or uh, whatever we Yeah, we yeah I'll, I will start by posting. Uh, maybe I can just push this into the repo. So there are a few questions from the crowd. Yeah. Uh, so um, given you have a Scala background, um, uh, uh, can you give some examples of why someone would choose Kotlin over Scala? So what, what, what makes uh, Kotlin suitable for building a system like this? So um, Kotlin um, is, is built to uh, leverage the Java ecosystem and uh, make people who are used to working with Spring, used to uh, working with all the tools you have available, uh, and, uh, you just go on, do your, your thing. It doesn't have any opinion about what you're doing. All it does is it gives you new syntax, which is uh, more concise, less in your way. Um, and uh, this is completely different from what Scala was. Scala, uh, I think now 13 years ago, it sort of entered the scene as a better Java. And a lot of people choked on this because it's not a better Java. It's a different language altogether. It's a different ecosystem, a different standard library. And all the libraries uh, and, and frameworks that get built for Scala are uh, have very opinionated in a different direction than the, the ecosystem of Java. Uh, so for me, uh, it only makes sense to do Scala if you have a very specialized uh, team uh, or, or specialized goal where you, have, uh, you need to do a very high uh, uh, parallel uh, stuff for currency uh, of time and uh, well Kotlin is probably just for most of the purchase because most of us were just building uh, stupid web servers that do CRUD 
and uh, we have maybe 10 users per day uh, or maybe 10 concurrent users and uh, load uh, stuff is you know, it can be happily be handled by a spring even if you don't do web plots but you do just do a nice uh, classic uh, spring where you do blocking and all the like it will just work um, mm -hmm. and, and yeah scala is a very deep investment if you're coming from a java background uh, you need to learn uh, completely new paradigms you need to relearn everything you know about your your tools about your uh, libraries you use you use different by, uh, yeah, different frameworks all together. Um, so learning the syntax takes a day. Learning how to use the syntax it takes years. Uh, learning how to uh, work with everything, it, it's, it's so much more work. Uh, and I happily did, did this investment, but yeah, uh, building software is a team sport. Everyone in your team should be able to do this. And uh, as soon as, uh, as I discovered Scotland, I thought like, okay, this is what's going to pull everyone who's doing Java into the, into the current, into the, uh, into the future. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's a, a very nice target for where Java should evolve to. Uh, so I, yeah. So I think is that what you meant with the, with that the Kotlin uh, uh, would be the future? Like in the beginning, you mentioned that? Uh, I think so. Uh, yeah, so uh, to me, Java is, is stale. Uh, it has been playing catch up for at least 10 years. Uh, since Java 7, it was stuck. Uh, and Java 8 gave a bit of uh, toys, but not very, uh, very exciting toys from my perspective. And then we had to wait for a very long time to get the actual new things they had been promising since uh, Java 7. And yeah, they, 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 they are trying to play catch up really, really hard. But somehow they have a knack of misnaming everything they do and uh, trying to learn from uh, what new, uh, new technologies do, but not let go of what is there. Uh, they, have a, they really want to keep this ecosystem which is already there, which makes it very hard for you to introduce something like Webflux already, uh, which is then non-blocking uh, and already tries to pull the ecosystem in a different direction. Uh, and, and Kotlin actually already pushes you towards this in a much more friendly way with doing immutability by default, uh, having you uh, more sort of first-class citizens, uh, lambdas, uh, and allowing you to do functional programming without having to learn new languages, new paradigms, and all that thing. You can learn Kotlin in a few hours, the syntax yeah. at least. And, and um, so uh, th this, this example was uh, Kotlin. So um, uh, there, there is a question about if, there, if it's possible to create a backend and from that using Kotlin React or um, yeah, instead of TypeScript for a project, have you have any uh, experience with well, that? Well, I am uh, a big advocate of using what's there and not fighting the ecosystem. Like Kotlin leverages the Java ecosystem. Uh, Java, Kotlin doesn't leverage the, the JavaScript ecosystem. That's what TypeScript does. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you might like Kotlin of TypeScript, but it is just not the way of the ecosystem. Uh, so for now, uh, I would say Kotlin is an, uh, a, a nice toy in, uh, in front end land, but it's not something of, of the, the ecosystem of the mainstream. Uh, so right now, I would change uh, to Kotlin and. I'm actually liking TypeScript a lot because it's way more powerful than Kotlin, but yeah, that's because I'm used to power from Scala. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I do understand that a lot of people get confused about what Kotlin, uh, what the TypeScript offers you. So if you're yeah. just a backend developer and want to be doing JavaScript, it might actually be very good for you. Scala, uh, Scala JS, there are quite, are quite a few people who are really enjoying it. Um, yeah. yeah, but it, yeah, it's still niche. To me. Yeah. Exactly, because I had a question about the, uh, you used MongoDB. Um, is there any reactive support for a uh, relational database? Like, uh, No, not yet. Uh, uh, everything works through, G, uh, through GPA. Uh, uh, what is it, GPA? Uh, yeah, GDBC. Uh, GDBC, and mm -hmm. that's blocking by nature. Like, this is architecture uh, design uh, decision is blocking. So there's no way to build a truly non-blocking uh, reactive driver on top of uh, G G 
Yeah. And um, so yeah, that's when you go to the Mongos, or uh, if someone manages to write a driver for Postgres that completely bypasses a GP. Um, then it might work, but I haven't seen this happen. But I well, I must confess I haven't put ex uh, special effort into finding this out. Usually, you can do it just a blocking that uh, connection to a database and uh, giving it its own perspective. All right, thanks. So uh, one more question: um, Someone couldn't distinguish Kotlin from Webflux in the example. Uh, the question was: Where do you use Webflux in the handler code? Uh, let's see if I can show. So what's Webflux? Uh, the part of what uh, is actually the reactive uh, server is because this, uh, let me see what is this? Tell me where this thing is coming from. This is coming from Project Reactor. Uh, this HTTP server, and it is a different HTTP server than you get with normal Spring, uh, and it uses the Reactor uh, backend, uh, which is one of five choices you have, uh, and uh, they all don't use the Serpent API; they use a different system. How many choices do you have? Uh, there's about five they uh, promote on the Spring website. Uh, I can't remember what they are, but uh, they, they promote them there. So. The black box thing, uh, they, they have a very nice illustration of the website. Uh, if we can go on. So there is the picture. Well, I can't see the picture, of course. Not complex. Keep hitting the picture if you're searching for other stuff, but if you want it right here, they explain it. So, uh, if you take Spring or Spring Boot, which uh, aggregates it, uh, normal Spring MVC is built on top of the Serpent API, and uh, Webflux is built on top of a different abstraction layer altogether they built, which, for, which is the Webflux. And this builds on Netty, or uh, it can be done on uh, Serpent uh, if you have the latest version. Uh, but it doesn't use the normal Serpent uh, API, which uses uh, thread locals for sessions, and uh, it has a, a, a blocking API which you can't get around. So, uh, where are you? Here you are. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the main difference. But, uh, in my example, I actually leverage what other, thing, other things uh, Spring provides you. It's these nice DSLs for uh, doing functional DSL uh, stuff, uh, where you don't have to use the dependency injection system, which you normally use in Spring MVC. And I think you can mix and match them even, so you don't have to uh, go from Webflux to use a bit of a DSL and, and vice versa. Yeah, all right. Thanks again, Joost. Thanks for answering questions. Uh, thanks for uh, doing this live coding session.